what? Love one another? That means sometimes you may have to get wet for one another. <laughs> but notice I didn't ask anybody to go that didn't have an umbrella, so I didn't ask you to suffer too much. And, but they were an illustration, weren't they? Of what we're supposed to be as the body of Christ for each other. Okay, let's welcome back the part of the body that just got a little damp. <laughs> Is it still raining? <laughs> okay. Uh, the, it's still raining, just quit. It's, o it's only, only three of you came back. Is that the correct number? <laughs> there are casualties, Bill. Bill, I have no one to watch out for your brother and test. <laughs> I'm not sure what he said, but I'm going to laugh anyways. <laughs> We belong to each other, folks. There is privilege and responsibility that goes to that. If we are part of the body of Christ, if Jesus Christ lives inside of us, then we have responsibility for each other. And, and I'm going to fall into this more than once during the message this morning, but I'm just going to say right from the start, there is no such thing as a Christian who survives by themselves. You cannot be, and, and we're going to all hear it, right? And hey, some of us have maybe said it. I don't need to go to church. I don't need to go to worship. I can believe in Jesus on my own. And you know what? You can believe in Jesus if you're by yourself. But the fact is, you are like an ember sitting away from the fire by yourself when you're not part of the body of Christ. And in fact, many would probably agree with this statement. It's impossible. It's impossible to say you're really a part of the body of Christ and not be a part. Somebody this morning needs to uh, simply break off their little finger and throw it in a trash can, okay? Could you do that? I mean, how many of you need your little finger? <laughs> Some of you do. <laughs> okay, so here's what I want you to do. Uh, just to try to illustrate my point this morning. Right now, everyone needs to go to their car, slam their little finger in the door. Okay? This morning? Oh, no. I, you know, see, it's too long ago if you've done it in the past. If your fingernail's not blue, purple, black, you need to go do that right now. And then you'll find out how important every member of your body is. Ray Steadman had this great little comment. He said, a number of years ago, I fell and injured my wrist rather severely. It swelled up and it got very painful. And he says, and the rest of my body felt so bad about it that it sat up all night without any sleep. <laughs> yes, the littlest things can affect our whole body, don't they? And Christ has established this incredible supernatural principle that he invites us to be one long to one another. He doesn't want us trying to stand out there in the rain by ourselves. He wants somebody to hold the umbrella for us. He wants somebody to feel the pain with us. He wants somebody to walk beside us. He wants somebody to encourage us. He, he has set it up. He wants us to have the kind of oneness that he experienced with God the Father. Why was Jesus Christ able to go to the cross? Why was he able to stand there and take the attack of evil upon him? Why was he able to die when he was innocent and take all the pain of the world and pay the price of sin because he was one with God the Father. What was the pain that he felt maybe the most on the cross? Well, think back about what he said. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He felt the pain, the hurt. <laughs> like the kids, I guess, are hearing feeling downstairs. <laughs> he felt the pain of being separated from his Father. Think of that. 
Yes, he'd been tortured. His body had been ripped apart. I mean, chunks of it torn out by the whip and the stones that went in there. He'd been beaten. He'd been disgraced by his own disciple. He had been denied by the one he loved called Peter. And he hangs there and they are attacking him. And they're even saying, if you're the son of God, then remove yourself from the cross. You know, if you're, if you're really who you say you are, just prove it by call the angels. And he's hanging there on the cross and his arms are burning and they're starting to spasm. His muscles are tightening up and releasing and tightening up and releasing. He's struggling to breathe. And none of that compares to the pain as he takes evil on himself and is separated from his Father. And he prays that we would be one with the Father. We're going to look at uh, Romans chapter 12 this morning. Um, just a few verses and that are the, the focus of our, of our message. Romans 12, verses 3 to 5 says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each one of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to to all the others. <clears throat> this is really the conclusion of our month on the mission statement, the, the mission that God has given to us as a church. It's, it's the final week because this is the week that we say, okay, now we're going to make it all our own. We're going to commit ourselves to each other. It's a covenant. It's a supernatural, spiritual relationship that we're committing to. But to begin that, it's really helpful to hear what Paul says here at the beginning. He says, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. Wiest says we have an illness. He's a theologian. He says, we have a really serious illness. It's an epidemic in the church. You might want to get your flu shot for this one because it's a major problem. He, he calls it comparisonitis. Comparisonitis. It's the tendency to measure one's worth by comparing oneself to others. Do you look down on others and think highly of yourself because you possess a more showy spiritual gift than someone else? Paul's antidote for comparisonitis is not to see ourselves as we stack up against others, but to exercise sound judgment. What needs to change in your assessment for you to judge yourself soberly? Maybe you need to hear the words of Jesus again as he looked at some men who were thinking that they were pretty good compared to other people. They were suffering from the, the illness of comparisonitis. In Luke 18 verse 9 it says, To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told them this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like the other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Anybody fit these roles? You're better than some. You're, you're, you're not really a mess, right? You, you, you live pretty well, do pretty good things. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven. But he beat his breast and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then Jesus, in addressing this sickness of comparisonitis, says, I tell you this, that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought. Uh, another way that Paul said that is you need to think soberly of yourself. 
You, you need to maybe be a little bit more serious about who you are and not try to compare yourself to other people. In fact, when Paul says this, he says, you know, that's what I've been talking about now for the first 11 chapters really explain to you how you can think more soberly. How many of you ever heard of the Roman road to salvation? Some of you have. In Romans are these descriptions in the first 11 chapters. And listen to some of them. This will help you to not think more highly of yourself than you ought. To think more soberly of yourself. Romans 3.10, as it is written, There is none righteous, not even one. Oh, shucks. Thought I was maybe getting close. Nope, you have, you're not. Okay. There's none righteous, not even one. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Oh, me too? Yes, me too. Every single one of us have sinned. Every single one of us has fallen short of the greatness of God, the glory of God, what God would want for us. Romans 5.12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. Guess what? Because of my sin, I'm going to die. And all people are going to die. That's one place where it's common ground. Did you know that? We all die. Romans 6.23 For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. He says, okay, look, if you want to think soberly about yourself, realize that the only way you get eternal life is it's got to come to you as a gift from Jesus Christ. It's not something you can earn, not something that you deserve. In fact, you deserve death. Romans 5.8. But God demonstrates his own love to us, toward us in that while we were sinners, yet... Sinners, Christ died for us. While we're still opposing Him, Christ dies for us. And then Romans 10, 9 and 10. How do I get one with God? If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. How do you get one with God? Believe in your heart, Jesus is Lord. Confess with your mouth that you believe that. There's those two straightforward steps. It starts in the heart, and then it's got to come out of your mouth. Ray Steadman going on. Oh, I had one more verse, sorry. For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord, what? Will be saved. So if you express from your heart you believe in God and you say, I believe, and you confess it with your mouth, then what does God say? Then you will be saved. How do you get, Ray Steadman says, how do you get a right opinion of yourself? Well, Paul gives us the answer. It's by realizing that God has allotted to each a measure of faith. It is by recognizing that everything you have is given to you by God, even your faith. Yes, <laughs> every one of us. How many of you went through school? Got a graduate degree, so like a college degree or something like that, right? So you're, that means that you've been successful and you're the one who caused you to be successful, right? It was your intellect, your brain, your money, your, your student loans, all those kind of stuff, right? Wrong. Who gave you the brain? Who gave you the ability? Who connected you to with people? Who taught you to think and taught you to feel? Who, who gives you the ability to breathe? You see, we give so much credit to ourselves when in fact the credit should be given to God. And that's what Stedman says will help us to get a right perspective. Even, how many of you believe in Jesus, have believed in him for a long time, have a, a relationship now, I've experienced the presence of God. How many would you say that? Only one. Two, three. Okay. Some of you are saying, I don't know, is he really asking me this or not? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm asking you. Have you experienced the presence of God? Okay, why? Is that because you're so wonderful? You're better than somebody else here in the room? <laughs> no. It's because of what God has done for you. God's the one that's drawn you to him. God's the one that's made himself known to you. Stedman goes on, he says, I, I learned three things. He says, number one, I need to realize that I am made in the image of God. We have been formed in the view that God had for us. Made like Him. Number two, he says, I'm filled with the Spirit of God. 
It's the Holy Spirit that gives us life and faith and power and strength and anoints us to, to serve Him. And number three, I am a part of the plan of God. God has a plan that He wants you to be a part of and wants you to be involved in and He wants you to join Him in that. I guess when we're looking at ourselves and I'm still on the point, don't think more highly than you ought. When you're looking at yourself, how humble are you? As you look at other people, how humble are you? Because we do fall into, don't we, looking at others and comparing ourselves to them. And the fact is, how humble are you compared to Christ? Christ humbled himself, taking on the form of a servant. He emptied himself of the glory of heaven and came to earth, placed himself within a human body, limited himself in that body for 30 some years, and then died on that cross. How humble are you? Sometimes people get a little proud of the gifts that they have, and their abilities. One of the most dangerous places to serve the Lord is right here on this platform. We become performers. We present ourselves in such a way, and then, and then what happens? And one of the, the, the most dangerous thing of all, somebody praises us. Oh, I like what you do. I like how you sound. And, and then we do more. And we, and we start to seek that attention. And, and in the process, <laughs> in the process, we lose the focus of what we're here for. The people on this platform have one responsibility to help point you towards God. God's the attention. God's the focus. God's why we're here, not for us up here. I, mean, I pray that every time I preach that God will speak through me. But folks, this is not about the glory for Bill, is it? Or the glory for a worship team. We need our attention when we're here to be on Him, not on us. God gifts different people in different ways, doesn't He? And, and we're going to look at that in a few moments again, but as Corinthians talks about it, Romans talks about it, Ephesians says it, 1 Peter says it, that all, every believer has been anointed with supernatural gifts from God. And frankly, I do think it's more than just one. And I think that maybe the only thing that might limit the usage of those gifts is us, not God. The Holy Spirit wants to fill us up and give us gifts to serve Him. And there's a variety of those gifts, he says. And the challenge is, is that sometimes we exalt one gift over another. And we lift up somebody who has a certain gift. But listen to this. The spiritual gifts all come from God. It's not because we're so special. Okay? The spiritual gifts are God's. And then he chooses to place them in the hands of certain people. And some of us are using those gifts and some of us aren't. But God is giving those gifts. They're His gifts, and they're meant to be used for His glory and for the building up of the body. Um, McDonald says, Any gifts we have are not for selfish use or, or display, but for the good of the body. No gift is self-sufficient, and none is unnecessary. When we realize all this, we are thinking soberly. Considering that the root is charis, right? Did you know that? To be charismatic, to have the spiritual gifts, the, the charis, it, it, it comes from the word grace. Considering that the root is charis, the favor or gift which one receives is without any merit of one's own. You don't get a spiritual gift because you're so special. You get a spiritual gift because God's so special. Stated another way, whatever spiritual gift a man has comes from God and should be no cause for personal pride or praise. It is something given to a man by God which the man himself could not have acquired or attained on their own. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. Secondly, we're members of one body. 
Ephesians 1.22 says, And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. What's the head? Jesus is the head. Instead, he goes on, verse, chapter 4, verse 15, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head, that is Christ. From Him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. We need each other, folks. We're members of one another. Members of one single body, and it's the body of Christ. And who's a part of that body? <laughs> and this is where some people say that when we get to heaven, we're going to be, some people are going to be walking down the halls of heaven, and they're going to walk up to a certain room, and Jesus is going to say, we need to be quiet here. Why? Well, because that's the church that doesn't believe anyone else is here. <laughs> If you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross, rose from the dead, and is coming again, and you've received him into your life, and you've confessed that publicly, what did Romans say? Then you shall be saved. And to anyone who has done that, Christ says, you are part of my body. One of the challenges we face is that we are moving through a time in which the world wants us to have not just one Christian body, but all religions to be one body. That's not, that's not what God's saying. It's the body of Christ, where Christ is the head that we are one. Now, should we respect one another? Yes. Should we value one another? I mean, Jesus even said, love your enemies, I think, right? So we have responsibility to care about one another. But oneness, and the oneness that Jesus is praying for, and the oneness that we have, that we are members of one another, is all about the body of Jesus Christ that we're a part of. Colossians says it this way, do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They're puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. So watch this out for somebody who's telling their dreams and saying how wonderful they are. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. You need to watch Daryl Davis right now for a while. He doesn't dance real well. <laughs> he doesn't run the 100-yard sprint very well. He doesn't even kneel very well. He's in pain. He's getting ready, and we're praying for the, the doctor to be able to schedule the appointment so that he has surgery on his knee. That knee is causing him a lot of problems. It's a knee, folks, right? It's a meaningless part of your body. Come on, I mean, how many of us, well, I don't know, some of you maybe do watch knees, but anyways. <laughs> Daryl is an example of the fact that we are all part of a body. And if one part of that body is suffering, the whole rest of the body is hurting. The whole rest of your life is influenced when you have one part of your body that's, that's messed up. Have any of you had a sore throat yet this season? <laughs> was that a what? <laughs> had a sore throat yet this season? <laughs> yeah, if you had a sore throat, uh, did that influence the way you behaved? Did that influence your lifestyle? Did that influence the kinds of things that you did with your time and energy? Of course it did. It's a little sore throat. You can't even see in there. Or at least we don't want to. Okay? <laughs> we are all part of a body. The body of Christ. If you've committed your life to Jesus Christ, you're a part of that body. And you have privilege and responsibility as, that, as part of that. And we have privilege and responsibility for one another. We're members of the body of Christ. Stedman says the human body is made up of a number of different members. There are hands and feet and arms and legs and eyes and ears. And the list goes on and on. What part are you? I was thinking, it, the reason why I used the illustration earlier about smashing your little finger in the, in the door. So is, is Crestline First Baptist the fingernail on a little finger? <laughs> or is it the, finger, the, the toenail on your little toe? 
<laughs> what, what, what part are we as a part of that larger body of Christ? Because the body of Christ is larger than Crestline First Baptist, isn't it? It's the sum of all those. In fact, when you look at the totality of the body of Christ, it makes up all of those who have followed Jesus Christ from the time he died on that cross and rose from the dead and committed their lives to him. That's the body of Christ who've lived through eternity and will in the future come to know him. And it's made up of all those believing fellowships, communities, believers who know Jesus Christ personally. You know, in, in talking about the body, Stedman says there's differing members, each have differing functions. The eyes and the ears are not interchangeable. He talked about his youth minister, Rich, Richie. He says, Richie uh, came to the youth group one night and he had a football. And he painted an eye on the football. And then he had it wrapped in a blanket. And he brought it in and he said, I want to introduce you to my baby. <laughs> now can you imagine dating an eye? <laughs> <laughs> Sitting across the table from an eye. And trying to have a conversation with an eye. And, and having that eye help you lift something that's heavy. Or even have that eye eat something with you. I mean, you know, if we were all an eye, we'd be a problem, wouldn't we? We need every single part. Every part is important. In fact, Paul even said even the unpresentable parts, the more private parts, the secret parts. You see, we all, as a part of the body, have been gifted by the Spirit of God. And because of that, we belong to one another. Think about that. We belong to one another. Not as in, okay, I own you. <laughs> know something about you, so I own you. No, 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 that's not what we're talking about, are we? To belong to one another says that we are members of one another, like, we're me like our various body parts are members of the body. Can you get along without your hand? Yeah, you could do it. It might be difficult. How about a leg? Yeah, again, you could do it. It might be difficult. How about a kidney? Yeah, you could do it. Might be difficult. <laughs> How about both kidneys? <laughs> yes, you could do it with dialysis. Might be difficult. Okay. How about your heart? Yes, you could do it if you had one of those artificial machines that you were hooked up to that ran your heart. In fact, they've been continuing to work on that, trying to create a, a plastic like moving heart and all, right? But it'd be really difficult. Lungs, all those things. How about your brain? Hmm. Central nervous system. It runs the whole thing. How do we determine when somebody's dead today? Not just when you stop breathing. Not just when the heart st stops ticking. It's about brain activity, isn't it? The brain is in the head. We're alive because we're connected to the head. And each of us is a part of that body. And each of us has privilege and responsibility in that body. We belong to each other. Just like my hand belongs to the rest of my body. <coughs> And together, we, I need the various parts of the body. Can we get along with that? Oh, yeah. So what if you are called by God and gifted by God to do something special and you don't do it? Can the body of Christ get along without you doing it? Yes, but it'll be difficult. What if God has chosen you as the specific person to communicate God's love to your neighbor? Can God communicate that love without you? Yes but it'll be more difficult. You see, God has called us to be a part of a unit, working well together, sharing what we have, blending our resources together because we belong to one another. Here's how he said in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 12, if you want to turn your Bibles and open up to this section, it's a longer section. It says, Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ. Verse 13, For we were all baptized by one Spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one Spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part but of many. Now the foot should say, Because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. If the ear should say, Because I'm not an eye, 
I do not belong to the body. <clears throat> Sorry, lost my place. <laughs> So I'm going to back up and start over. Verse 14, Even so the body is not made of one part but many. Now if the foot should say, Because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. If the ear should say, Because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, like the football, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Think about what that's saying. The eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part, here's the key, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. Can you imagine somebody standing up and saying, they're getting praised for something that they've done. You've done a great job. Here, we're going to give you this award. Excuse me, um, my hands can't accept the award. They were not a part of it. No, no, my, my feet weren't a part of this. You know, uh, Actually, it wasn't my lungs either. You know, it was just, so you just need to give it to this part. Of, no, no. It's the whole body is working together. Jesus is trying to help us to understand. And Paul's emphasizing that to us. Think about this. We are members of one another. I want you to just think of a few of the one another phrases. Members of one another from our text. We're supposed to be devoted to one another. Really? Devoted? That talk is about, talks about commitment to each other, doesn't it? That's not just hi on Sunday morning and goodbye. That's about relationship that's developed. We're supposed to honor one another. How do I honor you if I don't even know you? I have a responsibility to show esteem to you, value you. We're to call to honor. We're, we're supposed to be of the same mind with one another. That's Christ, isn't it? We're one in Jesus Christ, Paul said. We're supposed to accept one another. Oh, great. That means you have to accept my idiosyncrasies. You have to accept my weaknesses. You have to accept my shortcomings. No, it just said accept one another, right? It's, we're supposed to admonish one another. Now notice it didn't say criticize. didn't say gossip about. didn't say put down. Admonish means that I believe and care about you enough to say, hey, you're messing up. Can I help you not go that way? Admonishment stands with somebody and helps them to become something different. We're supposed to greet one another, serve one another, bear one another's burdens. How do we do that if we haven't spent some time together? You look around the room, you know, I've seen most of you smile sometime this morning. <laughs> so therefore, I can simply assume you've got it wonderful. You're not hurting at all. You've got no problems. Because you're super Christians. Obviously you are. That's why you're here. You came out in the rain. The, the, the not super Christians didn't come today, right? <laughs> they didn't make it. You're the saints and the spiritually gifted and anointed and all. So you're wonderful, right? We're supposed to bear one another's burdens. There's things we're going through, but we're keeping them to ourselves and God didn't mean for that. He called us to work together. He called us to submit to one another and to encourage one another. You have um, in your worship bulletin a membership covenant. You might want to pull it out. This is the notes for the rest of the message. In our membership covenant, number one, we, we are united with people who have accepted Jesus Christ who have said yes to Jesus Christ in their life. Now notice, that doesn't say they're perfect. <laughs> but they believe that Jesus Christ died, rose from the dead, is coming again. They've accepted that. They've accepted Him as their Lord. 
and been baptized as believers. You make the statement to follow Jesus and then you identify with him publicly. That's the believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. The beauty of baptism, it's an image that can speak to anybody who doesn't know Jesus Christ. That, that Christ, with Christ we were buried with him and we rose with him. And that's what a baptism is, identification of. It's an act of obedience and an act of submission. And we do that by faith. We respond to what God has called us to. We respond to His love. So the covenant says, I have accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. And having been baptized as a believer, now feel led by the Holy Spirit to commit to membership with the Crestline First Baptist Church by the power of the Holy Spirit. I now commit myself to God, the body of Christ, and to this community to do the following. Let me just pause for one moment. <coughs> Membership has nothing to do with having your name on a list. Membership, the only way it's connected to salvation is because you've received the salvation as a gift from Jesus Christ. But just because you have your name on a list at a church doesn't mean you're saved, does it? No, what makes you saved is what Jesus Christ did on that cross and your acceptance of that payment for you and your belief in that. And then what Paul say? As you confess that publicly, as you make that known, that's why baptism is so significant. As you confess that publicly, then Christ is at work in your life. So he says, so the first step of our covenant is that we want to protect the unity of our church. By acting in love toward other members, by refusing to gossip, by following the leaders. Unity is something that's easily broken down, isn't it? if we start to dislike somebody. You know, some of us have some idiosyncrasies that are uh, unnerving to other people. Right? There's, there's some things that we do that, that bother other people. <laughs> and yet, we are called to act in love toward the other members. Rather than saying, okay, I don't like the way that guy's blows his nose. <laughs> so we'll just cut off the nose. I, I, I don't like the way that guy shakes hands. <laughs> okay, a little muscle to it, please. <laughs> so we'll just cut off the hand. Yeah. It's more serious than that though, isn't it? There's things that we, frankly we don't like about each other. Don't like an opinion somebody has. Don't like their politics don't like their attitude, don't like their jokes, whatever. There, there's things we don't like about each other. And he says, we are supposed to act in love toward each other. One of the things that greatly undermines the unity of any church, it's a, something that is that evil knows, Satan knows. This is one that is wonderful to use, and that is gossip. Happens in a small community, doesn't it? talk about people, share stories about one another, and it happens in churches, and it is one of the most evil things that we can do. Talk about somebody else, and one of the most evil ways that we can do that, I have a prayer request to share with you today. I want to talk to you about Carol. Yeah, hope she doesn't hear this, but, yeah, and, and so then we go into this, you know, long thing about all about Carol's life and all, and, and tell them all the bad stuff about them, and, and what? That is gossip, friends, and we need to start admitting and recognizing the sin of that and the evil of that and confess it and quit it. If you're going to build the unity of the body, you can't be gossiping about somebody else. And notice the third one there. This one you might say, well, do we have to? I will protect the unity of my church by following the leaders. Well, let me tell you this. Hebrews says, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Leaders stand before God. Leaders need to account for what we did with your soul. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Yeah, a mad leader is not too nice, is he? <laughs> not too helpful. 
doesn't really bless. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden. But take note, leaders have to account. It's a serious responsibility, and frankly, I don't take it lightly. Ephesians 4, 3 says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Who should work for peace in this congregation? Who should work for peace in this community? Who should work for unity? Everyone. And that's the first aspect, of, the first part of the commitment of the membership covenant. Secondly, I will participate in the mission of my church. The fact is, is that if you're not serving, you're not really being a part of the body of Christ, are you? God's called us all to serve in His body and to participate in the mission. How? Well, by living a godly life. People are watching you. When they see you come here, they're watching to see how you behave. They're watching how you drive. They're watching how you park. They're watching how you treat one another. They're watching what you say. They're watching how you drive away. People are watching the, the church to see what we, how we are and what we behave and what we do. We participate in the mission of the church by living a godly life. We participate by inviting the unchurched to attend. Folks, would you like, those of you who have been longer in this church than a year, would you like this church to grow? Well, maybe you wouldn't. There's some people that really like the small church. We want it to stay less than 50 or 60 people. That way we can know everybody, which we don't. That way we can get, you know, ha have our personal needs met, which, well, they're not really being met totally. I mean, do you want the body of Christ to grow? Well, then hire a pastor that will go out and do it. <laughs> right? Get one. Get one that will get a bunch of people in here. But when you do that, when that becomes the goal, you miss out. And guess what? We'll only reach as many people as I can reach. But when you realize that your responsibility is to invite people, your privilege, someday when you bring a guest here with you who has never been to church, you're going to listen to that sermon differently than you normally do. Oh no, he's talking about money. Why? The Sunday I brought a guest, he's talking about money. Couldn't he have talked about money some other time? Oh, I knew it because this guy talks about churches and always talking about money and now he's going to talk about money. Why is he doing it? You're going to be really concerned about the message that morning, aren't you? You're going to be praying about, why are they doing that song? I hate that song. Oh. You know, I told him we don't do songs like that. And now we're doing, and, and then look, and, and, oh Lord, and why did I bring him this Sunday? You're going to be really concerned. Ah, oh, but here's the cool thing. If that person says, you know what? You got something I want it. And the day they make their commitment to Jesus Christ, how are you going to feel? And if you do what I really like to have happen, you're in the baptistry baptizing that person. If you don't cry or feel some motion that day, you're not alive. Because when you get to baptize somebody that you've cared about, that you've known, that you've invited, there is nothing more special than that, than being part of them coming to Jesus Christ. Folks, I want you to share in that joy. But you got to invite. We need to make this be a, a year in which we're committed to inviting people. Hey, here's the worst they can tell you. Yes. Because <laughs> if they say yes, then you've got to be on your guard when you get here that day. Then you've got to see how you're behaving. Then, then you've got to act like a Christian in front of them. Then you've got to pretend and really live it and believe it and, and make it real for them, right? See, the fact is, people are saying no because we're not inviting them. And will you get us somebody telling you, oh no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> Besides, if I went the floor, the roof would fall in. You know, if they tell you that, just say, we need a new building, so please come. <laughs> <laughs> I will help with the ministry of my church by just... Uh, whoops, I skipped. 
by inviting you in church, and I will participate in the mission by warmly welcoming those who visit. Okay, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry if I step on anyone's toes. Guess where guests know to park. I'd love to ask Aaron, but I don't want to put him on the spot. But how did he know where to park when he came up here today? If, have you noticed we have a ton of parking here? <laughs> 17 parking places out front. <laughs> okay. If the 17 parking places are all full on Sunday morning, where does a guest go? <laughs> so they might go home if they happen to see that there was parking down by the coffee company. And oh, well, that's church parking, right? Yeah, there's a little sign down there that says, don't park here on Sundays. What? <laughs> yeah, it's because it's because too many people are coffee company people parking there on Sunday. It says, church parking only on Sunday, but it's a sign like this. Okay. So what's going to happen to the guest? Folks, are we welcoming of guests? Now, I didn't say, do you run up to them and beat them up when they get here? <laughs> but, but are we welcoming? How many of you were outside there with an umbrella welcoming somebody? Uh, just saying. Are we welcoming of guests? You think about that as to whether you are or not. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. We have a responsibility to reach the world for Christ, and we are not supposed to stop until we get to heaven. Three, I will help with the ministry of my church. How am I going to do that? I'm going to learn what kind of gifts God's given me. I'm going to try to learn how to improve my abilities to serve Jesus. I'm going to get equipped to serve, and I'm going to develop a servant's heart. I'm going to look for the opportunities to serve Jesus and the people in this church and in this community. And so Ephesians says, It was he who gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up. Wait a second, what does it say that leaders and evangelists and pastors are supposed to do? It says they're supposed to go out there and work. Hire a pastor who does all the work, right? It says they're supposed to equip us to serve. Equip us for the ministry. Uh, I haven't been to seminary, so do you love Jesus? That's all you need. Well, what if I say something wrong? You will. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> okay, you will. <laughs> but still serve. The best place to learn how to serve is where? In a classroom, right? If the classroom is life, yes. If the, cl if the classroom is a building, no. The best way to, serve, to learn to serve is by serving and make the mistakes. Same thing with the best way to witness is by doing it. The best way to learn to do anything is by practicing it. <clears throat> so I will help with the ministry of my church. And number four, I will share the responsibility for my church. And how do I do that? I think that one of the reasons why churches are weak and aren't reaching their communities may be this very next item. Because we have a responsibility to pray for one another. It's the focus of our life groups. It's for us to gather in relationship time and to share together and to pray for one another. And to pray for our outreach into this community. To, to pray against the powers of darkness and they are many. To pray against Satan. Literally, Jesus said, I'll build my church to Peter. He says, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. How? When the church is at prayer when the church is humble, when the church is willing to allow Jesus Christ to work through them. It's praying for its growth by attending faithfully. <laughs> See, you're the choir today, aren't you? you? You came when it was pouring today. But, but there's something about attending together that makes a difference, doesn't it? As we participate with each other, it's why we're inviting you to stay for the meal afterwards. There's, there's something about this relationship building that we've got to do more than just by sitting here and by giving regularly. Ah, he said, I knew he'd talk about money somewhere this morning. <laughs> but but, it's, but it's, the fact is that God has called us to give our time 
our talents, and our treasures. And if you're not giving in each of those categories, you're the one missing out. And the body is weaker because a portion of the body is not active. Think about your right arm hanging by your side and doing nothing. And that's what happens when the body, the body of Christ, God's people, are not giving financially, giving their time, giving their talents, serving the Lord. <clears throat> Hebrews says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. And frankly, this is why I also say, we're challenging you. Do more than just come here on Sunday. I'm sorry. I would love to get to know you better, but it's impossible when we're just here on Sunday morning. First off, I'm doing all the talking, right? So how well am I getting to know you if I'm doing all the talking? Secondly, how much time do we have? And do we have time for even me to speak one minute to every person here this morning? Okay, that's 78 minutes. That's not including the kids. How many of you are going to wait to be that 78th person? Good, Russ. I will see you at... Um, <laughs> Well, it's going to have to be 78 minutes after the meal because I also want to eat in the middle of there somewhere too. So, so it'll be somewhere around 2.30. Okay? Okay? Ha, <laughs> ah, but wait a second. Somebody should sing. It's not good enough for us just, just to get to know you, Bill, and you get to know me. Because God called us to be a body together. And we need each other uh, no offense meant, Bill, but I want to get to know some other people too. That takes extra time and commitment, doesn't it? And I would just urge you to think about what that means. I want to conclude with this statement. Christ's ones don't go it alone. Christ ones don't go it alone. Pride sometimes keeps us from sharing what's going on in our life, so we try to go it alone. Insecurity keeps us from opening up, so we try to go it alone. Sin's a big one, isn't it? The more embarrassed I am by my, sh my sin, the more ashamed I am, the less I want to share it, and I try to go it alone. Do any of you remember who Sharon Watkins is? Sharon Watkins was recognized by Time Magazine as one of the persons of the year. That a hint for you? Does this give you a hint? Enron. Sharon, Sharon was the whistleblower for Enron. And she reflected on what she had learned about taking her stand, because she stood by herself. She said, in hindsight, I also wish that some of my peers had gone with me to meet with Ken Lay. That was the executive of Enron. In high, Jordan Mintz was an in-house lawyer who was very concerned about this. I did not know that he had already taken these things to another law firm. And they had said that they are very problematic. I did not know that Vince Kaminsky had protested these things. So if I had just Vince and Jordan with me, the outcome might have been different. If someone is in the unfortunate position where I was, I say, don't go it alone. I should have found a few more people to go with me because then they could not have dismissed me as one lone person. Christ ones don't go it alone. The covenant is there for you to sign today. There's two pieces to the covenant. One is the sheet. This is what we're going to invite you to turn in when we have the meal. If you really can't stay for the meal, then we invite you to turn it in uh, in the bulletin, excuse me, in the offering plate. But you'll notice on here, whoop, wrong one. Oh, did you all get the wrong one? Yep, that's okay. <clears throat> um, the one you were supposed to have has a place for you to put your address on it. 
and it has a place for you to clarify your phone number. <laughs> so if you want to try to use white space uh, anywhere on here to clarify your contact information, your birthday, your email, and to even let us know how do you, would, you, would you like to be contacted? By phone, by email, by snail mail. That means post office, no offense, man. Sorry about that. It just takes longer, okay? Um, any of that information that you want to give us, uh, the, even though the, the lines aren't here, there's white space. The most important part of this sheet is to sign it and print your name and put the date so we know it's this year. This is for you to fold. Sign and date and take with you as a reminder of the covenant and as a reminder that you're not going to go it alone. A reminder that you're connected to not just this fellowship of believers but to the larger body of Christ and that God doesn't want us serving out there by ourselves. Now there are some occasional moments like that, right? Right? Paul was in prison by himself, wasn't he? So what did he do? He witnessed to the guards, turned them into Christians so that he was no longer alone. And God's called us to not be alone. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for the times this week, uh, the opportunity to be able to pray with other people in the church. There's... Um, challenges that different people are facing and I thank you Lord just for the opportunity to share those challenges with them and to be some word of encouragement for them to be a prayer support and I thank you Lord for the support that we've had as we are praying for the birth of of our son's uh, son's little baby Lord oh, I thank you that you don't want us to go through life on an island by ourselves. You created us for relationship with you and with others. I pray God against those things that want to try to harm the unity of your body. The criticism we uh, have towards others and to other churches even. The comparison that we do and Lord we suffer from that disease at times. Comparing ourselves to somebody else and thinking I'm not as strong or mature or wise or great as them or worse, thinking we're better than the person next to us. Forgive us, Lord. Help us, God, as you've invited us to be members of one another. It's a sacred responsibility and privilege, Lord. And help us to commit to that privilege this day. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Um, we're going to receive our offering.